Welcome, and thank you for joining us for Bartlett's 2022 strategy update. I'm Holly Mazaka, president of Bartlett Wealth Management. We're delighted you've joined us here today as we dive into strategies to help navigate the ever-changing landscape we are facing. When we started planning today's event, we were hopeful we'd be able to join some of you in person. However, for the second straight year, we're hosting our event exclusively online. As much as we hoped that 2021 would be a return to normalcy, we were faced with a new barrage of challenges. I'm proud to report that through it all, our Bartlett team grew stronger. We added six new team members, welcomed a record number of new clients, and maintained over a 97% client retention rate. For the third year in a row, Bartlett was named to the Barron's Top 100 RIA firms. We were also honored to be recognized at the top workplace by the Cincinnati Enquirer. As you can see from this picture here, I was just a little bit excited when it was revealed that Bartlett took home the number two spot in the small business category. This award is a well-deserved recognition of the tremendous effort our team puts in every day to make Bartlett a special place for both our colleagues and our clients. At Bartlett, we never wanna rest on our laurels. As we prepare for the future, we wanna hear from you. If you're a Bartlett client, you may have received an email requesting your input. This short survey will help us better understand where we are excelling and where we can continue to improve upon your Bartlett experience. If you've already taken a moment to respond to the survey, thank you. And if you haven't done so yet, allow me to ask one more time before the survey closes tomorrow night. This year, our event is titled A Balanced Approach, a timely reminder that during periods of market turbulence, we remain steady in our approach. Today, Jim Haggerty, Troy Snyder, Matt Stith, and Lori Poole will guide us through a conversation walking through how we are utilizing our investment and planning strategies to look ahead to what comes next. We encourage you to submit your questions along the way. Please use the question and answer function at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your questions. Our panelists will address them at the end of the presentation. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jim. Well, thank you very much, Holly, and good morning, everyone. We, we have a marvelous turnout, uh, people tuning in from all over the country and even overseas, so we're very grateful. And it's certainly a very interesting time uh, for a meeting. Uh, after a fantastic year for stockholders in 2021, the market is off to a bad start in 2022. In fact, it's one of the rockiest Januaries we've ever experienced. And as we meet here today, uh, the market is off about 10% for the month. And we open with two thoughts for you. Uh, first, this kind of turbulence is not unusual. Uh, history shows that it's, it's, it's rather commonplace. And second and more important, it's very important at a time like this, not to get too distracted and dismayed and to stay very committed to a long-term investment plan. And these two points are underscored by a chart I'm going to share. It's one of Bartlett's favorites. This is a chart that uses the S&P 500 index of stocks as a good stock market proxy. And we're looking at the last 35 years. And what you see is each of those 35 years from 1987 through 2021 is documented. In green, you see the rate of return for the S&P 500 for the entire year. In blue, you see what was the maximum setback the market experienced during the year. And so a couple of takeaways. First, you see a blue bar for every year. Every one of those 35 years at some point or another had some adversity and the market had a sell-off. Now, some were much more dramatic. Uh, of course, the chart begins with 1987 when we had the famous crash in October. 
And then toward the end of the chart, you see 2020, which I think we'll never forget. The first pandemic year and in February and March of that year, as you see, the market fell 34% measured by the S&P. So a lot of turbulence, it, it, it manifests just about every year. And on average across these 35 years, an investor could expect about a 14% drawdown at some point during the year. A very key point over this entire 35 year period, the S&P 500 index had an annualized return of 11.3%, just marvelous progress. At that rate of return, a dollar invested in 1987 grew to almost $42 by the end of 2021. Just a terrific result for a long-term investor. But to get that result, she had to put up with a lot of turbulence along the way, these occasional sell-offs and all the chatter and media sensationalism that comes with them. It's certainly tempting when we have these market anxieties to consider getting out. I'll get out and then I'll reinvest in stocks later on when things have stabilized and look more promising. Uh, that's very seductive at a time like this, but it's market timing and it simply does not work. And uh, Bartlett uh, does not practice market timing and discourages it. What we focus on instead, we really think the foundation for long-term success is discipline. And discipline for an investor is reflected in a good investment policy statement that very clearly articulates the goals and the objectives of an investor, uh, the strategies that will be followed, uh, the benchmarks for performance, and very importantly, it establishes a guideline for asset allocation, how Bartlett will blend assets like stocks and bonds and cash and other securities in a client's portfolio to meet her objectives and, and to do so in a way that matches her risk tolerance. That's really the key, uh, discipline rather than timing. Now, today we have three seasoned veterans of the firm to discuss the major asset classes, stocks and bonds, and, and to highlight how we integrate those asset classes today in an asset allocation that best matches a client's financial plan. Uh, the first of these veterans is Troy Snyder. And Troy joined the firm in 1990. He's in his 32nd year with Bartlett and he oversees all of the research uh, related to our bond and fixed income investments and manages a number of large uh, fixed income portfolios. And I think that makes Troy the ideal person at the firm to talk about this inflation situation that has really spooked the market lately. And so by way of turning things over to Troy, and, and I, I'm going to show you a chart on inflation over the last 40 years. Uh, this begins in 1980 when we had very high inflation coming out of the 1970s. And then you see a steady downtrend in inflation and a long period of very low inflation uh, that, that frankly was very good for investors. But recently at the end of the chart, you see what we're experiencing now, a significant pickup in inflation throughout 2021. So much so that by year end inflation, it hits 7%, uh, the highest since 1982. And, uh, Troy is going to talk about how this happened, uh, how policymakers are going to get it back under control, um, what kind of risks and opportunities that's going to create in the markets, and what Bartlett's, Bartlett is doing. Um, so I'll catch my breath and turn it over to Troy. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate the comments. Um, yeah, I'm going to speak really a on three areas uh, to address Jim's questions there. Uh, I'm gonna review uh, the consumer price index and look a little bit at some of the detail there. 
and discuss why inflation may remain above the Fed target of two to two and a half percent uh, for a few more quarters beyond what we're expecting. Um, now I'm gonna look at lessons that we learned from the 1970s when inflation was a real problem. Um, and with the Fed expecting to raise short-term interest rates this year, I'm gonna discuss why we believe long-term interest rates may rise, but they may not rise as much as short-term interest rates. And then finally, I'm gonna discuss how bonds have performed in prior years of inflation and why it's important to remain invested and not try to time the market on interest rates. So with that, let me just uh, shift gears and look at a couple of quick definitions to get going. And so here you'll see inflation. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with that, the steady increase in prices of goods and services. And I wanted to introduce this concept of money supply because it, it's really part of the inflation story. And I've got a chart later and it's basically the measure of all currency and savings. And, and so it, it has a role in this surge in inflation. Next, I wanna talk about three kinds of inflation. And really we've got all of these right now, sort of a tsunami of sorts. Uh, we've got cost push, which has developed uh, largely because of supply constraints. And here you see a picture of some semiconductor chips. Um, and it's quite notable that these problems have been pretty broad based, uh, but very focused in also in the, uh, the chip industry. And some of you may know and have heard that, uh, you know, just announced this, this past week that Intel is gonna build a, a real massive uh, manufacturing plant in central Ohio. Uh, they're talking $20 billion of investment and I'm sure large incentives to go with that. So an example there of, you know, the government and industry working together to help correct some of these supply constraints. So that'll be uh, good for our local economy going forward, especially. Um, scheduled inflation, those are the kinds of things that are escalators that are built into contracts, like for wages over time, and also you know cost of goods from one company to another. And then demand pull, you see a picture of a automobile showroom. And so uh, if you've been shopping for an automobile, you know that inventories are low. And, and again, that kind of gets back to uh, some of the supply constraints. And so, uh, you know, we're getting really uh, hit from all three angles right now in terms of inflation. So now I want to look at, you know, under the hood a bit here, what's driving this, this number. So Jim mentioned the last reading was 7%. Uh, you can see here the big culprits are energy and new and used cars. And uh, one I want to touch on briefly, because it's very important, is the housing sector. And there you see uh, it's more technically called owner's equivalent rent, but it was only up 4% last year. And the reason I wanna talk about that a little bit more on this next page, you'll see that it's a large component of the CPI or the consumer price index, 32%. And even though it's only gone up 4%, we anticipate that it will continue to rise throughout the coming quarters as high valuations of homes are, uh, you know, taxes are reevaluated and those, and also uh, rents reset. So the rental industry, um, as you know, once a year rents reset. And um, the other aspect that we're gonna be watching as the Fed starts to raise interest rates, if it impacts the housing market, the new housing market, and also uh, just home sales and people opt to rent instead of buy then that'll put additional supply and demand for uh, rental units and cause uh, more pressure on rising rents. So long story short, um, as we look forward, as some of these other sectors recede, and you know, food prices and energy prices start to come back to uh, uh, less of a problem, you know, the housing sector could continue to, to be a, a bigger component of, uh, of the CPI. And by itself, it could keep the CPI running at two and two and a half percent just because it's 32% of that index. So uh, that's something we'll be watching. Next, I'd like to uh, switch gears here and talk about the causes of inflation. Of course, I've already mentioned the bottlenecks and it, this is an example of inventory that's trying to get to market, but it's waiting on uh, parts and likely semiconductor chips. Um, so that's one big area. But the other area is um, money supply. And I, I mentioned that in the, my opening comment. Um, so this chart looks at the money supply 
And um, the blue line is the money supply. You see it took a dramatic upturn in 2020, uh, partly due to the Fed's response uh, with all the stimulus and just you know a lot of currency in the market. And the velocity of money, which is the darker line, um, that's how often currency turns over. So you can imagine when the economy was essentially shut down in 2020, the velocity or the amount of times our currency turns over uh, slowed down quite a bit. And so you see the recession, it's a very short period in 2020. And you look back to 2008 and 2009, that was our last recession and a, a long steady Im improvement in money supply over that period, but no great spikes until we get to 2020. In fact, I look back at M2 going all the way back to 1960, and it's been a steady increase in line until we get to 2020. That's the biggest jump we've ever had over such a short period of time. So when the Fed starts to try and work down the inflation pressures, uh, M2 or the currency in the, in the economy is something that they'll be, they'll be looking at. And so, you know, the Fed's going to raise interest rates. We're pretty well aware of that. Uh, he spoke yesterday, Chairman Powell, indicated that it's not out of the question that they wouldn't raise rates at every meeting this year. And there's seven more meetings. So a normal hike for the Fed is about a quarter of a percentage point. That would put short-term interest rates or those on money market funds and CDs up close to 2%, uh, one and a half to 2% even. So, you know, pretty meaningful and aggressive uh, uh, stance. And um, it's not to say that they'll do that, but he's just saying that they, they might. So that's something to keep an eye on this year. And uh, the reason I put this slide together though, was to talk more about long-term interest rates. So we know short-term interest rates are gonna go up, but what about mortgage rates and other long-term interest rates? In this case, I've got the 10-year treasury yield and so you can see it's began back in 2007 at almost 5%, 4.8. And recently it ended at about 1.5 at the end of the year. So you can see a steady decline in interest, uh, interest rates. But the real important point here is the amount of debt that we've now got on the economy. So we started over 10 years ago with 62% of our GDP. It's how much federal debt we had as a percent of GDP. And today, it's around 122%. You see it peaked at almost 136%. That's a lot of debt versus our GDP. And so the point of this is <clears throat> it's not going to take a lot of higher interest rates before that has a pretty meaningful impact on government spending because of a crowding out effect as you know those interest costs increase. So that, and if you think about corporate America, they also have a lot of debt. So rising, rising interest rates from these low levels will, have a, will take a big bite out of out of growth uh, so that's that's of course uh, a recipe for slowing uh, inflation so we'll see uh, if if the fed can walk the the, the fine line and not upset uh, you know the growth pattern too much so i mentioned the 1970s i want to look quickly here at what was going on in the 1970s these are all peak inflation points so the highest point there in 1980, 13.5%. This was a period of success and failure at reining in inflation. By the time we got to 1980, a new Fed chairman took place, Paul Volcker. Some of you may remember that, that name. And he famously raised interest rates the second month on the job to 20% to put, a, put cool water on this problem and uh, he did. He immediately ran unemployment from 6 to 11 percent, pretty much shut down the housing market. But he did stop this inflationary spiral. And by 1986, inflation was back into the 2 percent range. So he is widely credited with basically setting the stage for two decades worth of favorable economic growth for the United States once we uh, licked this inflation problem of the 1970s. So, um, so this rise to 7% is, is definitely worth something to, that the Fed's got their eye on. And by their comments yesterday, they're going to be very uh, uh, steady and, and diligent at trying to bring that down over the next you know, year or so. Now I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about um, you know, 
how bonds perform during inflationary periods and rising rate periods. And so there's, a, there's one very important message to take away from what I'm about to talk about. And that is if as interest rates are moving up, as inflation is moving up, you, know, you get a lot of volatile bond returns. You have maybe a couple quarters of negative returns, but then you'll be follow that with a, a quarter of a very positive and favorable bond return. And so moving in and out of the bond market and trying to time interest rates is really, really difficult to get those right. And so, as you can see, the longer period here from 1950 to 1981, as interest rates went from a very low level of two and a half percent up to 13.7%, uh, the return on the, the bond market was 4% annualized over that time. Inflation was 4.4%, so pretty much kept up. And then uh, that higher inflationary period from 1970 to 79, you know, Inflation averaged 7.3% and bonds returned 7%. So again, pretty much kept up, but only because you stayed invested the whole time. And what that allows is for uh, those cash flows to be reinvested quickly at those higher interest rates along the way. So with that, I'd like to conclude with just a couple of brief comments about our strategy as we move into 2022. And uh, overall, again, an emphasis on intermediate duration investments. So, you know, where we have a lot of bonds maturing between one and five years, that enables us to reinvest quickly at those higher interest rates. Uh, in corporate bonds, we, we favor consumer products, healthcare and banking companies. We still favor municipal bonds in this environment and those work well for taxable individuals. And we favor bonds with less sensitivity to rising interest rates. With that, I'll uh, turn it back to you, Jim. Troy, a quick question before we transition. Uh, you showed that chart of the 1970s and the inflation that was so pernicious. And one thing we, we remember from that time is that gold became very popular as a as an investment and as protection against inflation. Uh, what's your thinking on gold? Yeah, um, we're not advocating for gold investments here as pretty much as policy, um, you know, it, it's hard to value gold in terms of they don't have earnings, there's no dividends, there's no asset value. Um, gold really trades on emotion and nostalgia and so uh, it's not part of what we're recommending right now. Okay. Well, thank you, Troy. We'll be back to you later on with some questions from the audience. Um, our next speaker is also a uh, seasoned uh, veteran of the firm, Matt Stith, in his 14th year. Um, Matt oversees our equity research and stock selection process. And um, 14 years ago when Matt joined us, he had jet black hair. Now it, you know, it's, you can see some, he's earned some gray hairs navigating markets over the last 14 years. But uh, Matt, by way of kicking off to you, moving from Troy, um, your thoughts on stocks um, and, and how they can perform against inflation. Will they be a reliable, certainly rocky year to date, but uh, will they be a reliable hedge against inflation if it continues? Well, thanks, Jim. Um, and, and thanks for pointing out the gray hairs as well. Um, certainly a timely question. And, and uh, yeah, so inflation can be good for stocks and, and stocks can act as a hedge against inflation, provided that we don't see excess levels of inflation. So when we think about it, well-managed companies that provide highly desirable products and services can use an inflationary environment to raise prices. And this results in growing corporate profits, you know, providing the pricing exceeds input costs. And history tells us that stock prices follow corporate profits or at least anticipated corporate profits. At the same time, you know, companies are more likely to raise dividends as corporate earnings increase. You know, this helps protect the income stream for investors. However, you know, if inflation growth is, is too high, the economy can slow, as Troy mentioned, and eventually fall into a recession. Thinking about it a little differently, if companies are unable to offset the rising input cost or, or wage inflation, you know, profits can get squeezed. And, and if they try to get too aggressive on the pricing side, that can actually result in demand destruction. So 
the key really here is striking a balance. You know, it's also worth mentioning uh, that inflation brings the prospect of higher interest rates. So while higher interest rates can be beneficial to, to some companies and industry groups, you know, such as financials, uh, it can hurt growth oriented companies whose future cash flow is are less attractive in today's uh, in, environment. So the chart that, that you're looking at now shows several of our portfolio companies that we feel are well positioned to manage through or, or even benefit from an inflationary environment. So one example that I want to highlight is John Deere. Uh, John Deere is a company that is facing inflationary pressures on, on several fronts. Input costs such as steel, aluminum, and rubber tires have been experiencing inflationary pressures for the last several years. And more recently, Deere faced a month-long strike, which resulted in a new, more costly labor agreement with its unionized labor force. You know, included in this new agreement were bonuses, uh, wage increases, Deere uh, raised wages 10% in 2021, cost of living adjustments, and enhanced retirement uh, benefits, and more. However, on a positive note, you know, Deere expects to be able to offset much of this through their own pricing power. They're able to do this for a number of reasons. For example, they provide essential services and products. They have built market leadership positions, which has limited competition, and they provide best of breed innovative technology. You know, all of this has positioned Deere as the vendor of choice when farmers want or need new equipment, and this in turn supports strong pricing power. Thinking about inflation a little bit differently, um, farmers are also facing significant cost increases for things such as fertilizer, seeds, and pesticides. The new technology being offered by Deere allows farmers to be more efficient in their use of these inputs, which saves them time and money. This is another reason why farmers are willing to pay higher prices for Deere equipment. Matt, uh, the Deere example is a good one, but more generally, um, how do you factor inflation into your thought process uh, evaluating companies for the firm? Yeah, uh, so Jim, so, so while inflation you know, is one of many macro factors you know, that we think about in our stock selection process, you know, more of our focus is on, on really identifying those high quality, well-managed companies that can navigate you know, whatever economic challenges they face, you know, inflation included. So at a very high level, our goal is to, de to deliver clients a balanced portfolio of stocks that will generate positive risk adjusted returns through investment cycle. You know, we use the term all weather portfolios, meaning one that will perform well when, when the markets are, are doing well, but also will outperform market, uh, will also outperform market averages during periods of decline. And we really feel this is the formula for success over an extended period of time. You know, we accomplish this through a, di a diligent research process where we identify high quality companies whose stocks trade at reasonable prices in our opinion. So when evaluating a company or business, we look for those that are you know, market leaders, for example, um, have a competitive advantage, which creates high barriers to entry, have strong financial characteristics, are obviously well-managed, are innovative, have good long-term growth opportunities, are, uh, are, are financially sound, are shareholder focused, meaning they, they buy back shares and they pay and they raise dividends, and, and are providers of differentiated technology and essential services, just like Deere. By, by identifying and investing in these type of companies with these characteristics, we don't have to make predictions about things like interest rate movements or levels of inflation or where commodity prices are going, as we have a high degree of confidence that our companies will be well, well prepared for whatever challenges they face. When it comes to the stock we are most focused on, and most sensitive to valuation or the price we pay. We believe that buying a stock below its intrinsic value creates the greatest opportunity for long-term outperformance and helps reduce risk. In addition to valuation, we look at what type of market expectations are being priced in. We consider the size of the company as well as risk. So for a stock to be added to our portfolios, we need to be comfortable with both the quality aspects of the business as well as the stock itself. So thinking back to my earlier comments about putting together a balanced portfolio, um, controlling risk is something that is really important to us and something we spend a great deal of time on. As mentioned, this starts with identifying um, high quality companies whose stocks trade at reasonable valuations. Additionally, we limit and carefully monitor position sizes so as to spread that risk over a diversified portfolio. 
We also use sector weights to help control risk. As you can see in the, in the slide, we are currently overweight some lower risk sectors, such as healthcare and utilities, and we're underweight higher risk sectors, such as financials and energy. We monitor a number of risk statistics, such as standard deviation and beta, which helps gives us a good idea of what, what the volatility is of our underlying portfolios. We constantly stress test our portfolio for things such as market declines and, and changes in interest rates, as well as uh, changes in inflation levels. And of course, we keep a close eye on how our stocks are performing under these different market, uh, under these different market circumstances. Well, Matt, last year at this uh, meeting, we talked about some long-term, some secular trends that I know you're very enthused about that we really think make certain companies so very well positioned. And, and those were in the areas of technology, healthcare, and uh, renewable energy. And uh, just take a minute to update the audience on how those areas did in 2021 and, and what you're thinking going forward. Okay, of course. Uh, let's start with technology. Um, so while 2021 was a bit of a bumpy ride, the technology sector was a very strong performer, returning 34.5%. Uh, this compared to the 28.7 of the S&P 500. So the continued growth of cloud computing, cybersecurity, and remote working all supported strong demand for technology-oriented products and services. We remain bullish on the technology sector, uh, and some of our favorite names include Salesforce.com, Microsoft, Qualcomm, and MasterCard. You know, healthcare was also a strong performer, returning 26.3%. We find this particularly attractive for a lower risk sector. We remain optimistic on the sector going forward, and two of our favorite names here are Thermo Fisher and Abbott Labs. You know, and finally, renewables, um, you know, after a really great 2020, uh, the, the industry group struggled a bit in 2021 as it was up against some really high expectations. That being said, we remain optimistic on this group and with NextEra Energy being one of our favorites and a more conservative way to participate in the growth of renewable and clean energy. So one last thing before I conclude, I, you know, I wanna talk about uh, another theme that, that, that we're interested in and that would be the metaverse. You know, this is a really interesting area and one that we think offers some intriguing long-term investment opportunities. I'm sure that many of you have read something or, or heard about the metaverse in, in recent months as it has certainly been a hot topic. You know, defining the metaverse is not easy, but I really like how Microsoft sums it up. You know, Microsoft sees the metaverse as a persistent digital world that is connected to many aspects of the physical world, including people, places, and things. The metaverse enables shared experiences across both the physical and digital worlds. You know, when I think about it, um, I think about the metaverse as being a more immersive experience, meaning the ability to interact in a virtual world, much like we do in a physical world. Some, cur uh, some current world examples would include the use of virtual reality headsets. While virtual reality headsets have been around for a number of years, we have just started to see growth really accelerate, and we anticipate explosive growth going forward. A second example would be augmented reality. This is where digital information is overlaid on the real world. You know, maybe the best example that I can think of is the game called Pokemon Go. This game, uh, this is a game that has been popular for a number of years and has really been enabled by, you know, some of the recent technology advancements, such as some of the latest generations of iPhones. One last example would be the Peloton exercise bike. You know, this is where users interact with others through digital connections. You know, in the future, you know, we will see growth in digital worlds where you and I will be represented by cartoon characters called avatars. You know, through these avatars, we will, we will be able to do things like attend concerts or sporting events, or just hang out with our friends. We'll even be able to buy and sell digital goods. We believe that a number of our portfolio companies are well positioned to benefit from the growth in the metaverse. For example, Meta Platforms, you know, formerly Facebook. Meta is a leader in virtual reality headsets, and we also see a large opportunity for them to expand their digital advertising footprint. Uh, another example is Qualcomm. Qualcomm is one of the newer companies in client portfolios. 
Qualcomm produces products that support connectivity as well as microprocessors that go into things like virtual reality headsets. When I refer to connectivity, I'm meaning Qualcomm provides that technology that allows your smartphone or your iPad or your, your smartwatch to connect to the internet. Uh, Apple is another example. It is rumored that Apple is working on augmented reality glasses um, as well as virtual reality headsets. And finally, one other company who you might not think of as a metaverse play, as they're not a technology company, is Nike. Nike currently makes and sells virtual branded sneakers and apparel. They also offer a Nike land experience and a virtual showroom all within the metaverse. So stay tuned. There will be a lot of exciting developments and investment opportunities in this space. Well, Matt, that's great. Uh, we better let you catch your breath because we've had a lot of questions come in and uh, many of them are gonna be for you. Um, our third speaker um, is Lori Poole and Lori's in her 13th year with the firm. Um, Lori was our second CFP, Certified Financial Planner. We now have more than a dozen at the firm. And so she was really in the vanguard of Bartlett's pivot to uh, providing financial planning services 15 years ago, and that's now a core competency. And uh, I just think Lori's terrific. I love working with her with clients, and uh, she puts me in mind of that old E.F. Hutton commercial. You may remember, you know, when Lori Pool talks, people listen. Um, so Lori, um, Troy has talked about inflation, the whys and wherefores, the risks. Matt's as a stock oriented person, a little more upbeat, looking for opportunities. Um, why don't you put this all together and talk about uh, how we integrate this in, in your financial planning work? Inflation is certainly a risk that we've heard a lot about today, but it's really always a risk that we're planning for when looking at long-term financial plans. I do wanna mention before we get too far that inflation is not the only risk. A lot of our clients are worried about rising healthcare costs and even the prospect that returns might be more muted for the future. So as we look at planning over the long term, we believe that all risks are relevant, not just inflation in the coming year. I wanna take an example of a client, Mr. George Gray. So George retired three years ago and has had a pretty bumpy ride for the last three years, both in the markets and in his personal life. Personally, he's had to help his sister to and from doctor's appointments and also help his son's family with childcare during the pandemic when things were a little wild. And the markets have certainly had a bumpy ride in those three years. So it's been really crucial for George to work with his advisor to keep his plan on track for the last three years. I would distill it down with keeping George in mind to three main points that I'll cover today. Set a sustainable spending policy for your long-term financial plan. Put together an appropriate asset allocation for each of your portfolios. And last and most important is stick to your plan. The key to long-term financial planning is to find that balance between saving and spending. We find that our younger clients are really working hard to uh, enjoy their life today while still saving for their long-term goals and finding that balance. Whereas our retired clients are also trying to enjoy their life today, but they're trying to balance how much they can spend without running out of money for their projected life. Lori, on the subject of spending, there have been a lot of articles lately in the Wall Street Journal or Barron's or even Fortune magazine, and they're looking at this longstanding idea of the 4% rule and whether that's still relevant, whether that makes sense. So uh, talk about the 4% rule and how you think about that as you're thinking about spending. Well, the 4% rule, quickly, is the idea that you would take 4% out of the portfolio value each uh, in the first year of retirement. And then in each subsequent year, you could increase that with inflation. And then you would be projected to have enough money for about an average of a 30 year retirement. That seems like a fine rule, 
But for our clients, we need a more customized approach and they need a more dynamic plan for the future. So when we think back to George Gray, we have a lot of things to consider for him and not just the value of his, his portfolios. Things like social security income and pension income and how to factor all of these things into the puzzle that is a long-term financial plan. When we put that all together, we find that there are years where George needs maybe 6% of his portfolio. And there's other years where just 2% will meet his lifestyle. So staying invested is really the key to keeping a balanced portfolio, but really also a balanced mindset. We know that some years we're gonna have pretty big returns like we heard about in 2021, whereas sometimes we're gonna have rocky years like we've had for the first three weeks of this year. But at Bartlett, we don't react to these market swings. We don't let the highs get too high and we don't let the lows get too low. We're looking forward as we project portfolio returns based on the current market, but keeping a long-term view. So you can see on this slide that our uh, financial plans are using a projected return on stocks of just over 7%. Whereas on bonds, we're using a projected return a little over 1% and very near zero on cash at this point. As you put these all together, a balanced portfolio blending these asset classes is projected to return an average of 5% per year for the next 10, 20, or 30 years. We keep the same mindset with inflation when projecting that out. I know we heard that inflation is high now at 7%, but we're not assuming that it's gonna be 7% per year for the next 30 years. We're currently using a more moderate 2.5% annual inflation factor as we look forward. In the end, for the planning process, we're really looking to isolate the amount of dollars that our clients can spend and make their plan against, knowing that there will be unforeseen expenses and varying market conditions over time. So the second piece that I uh, mentioned I would talk about is asset allocation. We look to asset allocation to keep a balanced mindset going forward, and we memorialize this on an investment policy statement which is our interpretation of each client's goals. Once we have a target for spending and an estimate of what those future returns will look like, we can map out an asset allocation for each portfolio. Asset allocation is the most important determinant factor of our, our portfolio returns over time. So it's really vital to get this right in the planning process. Now, when we think of asset allocation, we think of it in two ways. We think about the risks that can come into play. Things like your debt obligations, future projected returns, projected cash flows, and other things as we build that asset allocation and put the safeguards into place. Well, safeguards are really the second piece. And that's the piece that we think is most important because it helps our clients sleep well at night. And I can tell you from client experience that this is really a vital part. So we heard about projected returns and just a little over 1% on bonds. And so we often get the question from clients, why should we keep bonds in our portfolio at all? Which is a valid question, uh, but we think that bonds really serve a purpose. You can see on this, in this slide uh, that we're charting the number of years that stocks and bonds were both up at the same time, going in opposite directions or down at the same time. And this is charting the number of years since 1926, so a very good, uh, good time period. And we can see that only 3% of the time were stocks and bonds down at the same time. So we can conclude from this chart that bonds will help us to dampen the downward experience that we get in our stock portfolios. And this happens uh, per the chart that Jim showed at the beginning, about 25 or 30% of the time do we actually end a calendar year where stocks are down. So for Mr. Gray, we've built that balanced portfolio and we've built up to a one year's worth of expenses as a cash buffer. We're also building up to four years worth of expenses in a bond portfolio. So this will help him have a healthy five years to let stocks recover if we have a depressed period. Now to put that into perspective, a balanced portfolio coming out of the 2008-9 recession 
took about three years to recover. So we always have that in our minds as we build safeguards into portfolios. And as we heard from Jim at the outset, there's going to be setbacks in our, in our portfolios and in the markets. So bonds are an important safeguard that we build to help keep the discipline of staying invested. Now, the third thing I mentioned at the beginning was sticking to your plan. Once we put a plan into motion, it's a part of every conversation we have with clients. We're always comparing against that backbone base level financial plan. It helps us to make decisions for clients and it helps clients to guide maybe unexpected things that will come up. We often get asked from clients if they can maybe gift a little bit more either to family members or to charities in a given year. Clients often wonder if they can afford to buy a second home. And something that we used to get pre-pandemic is if they could afford a little bit more for some travel and hopefully we get back to that someday. We believe that comparing these new unexpected scenarios back to the base plan for clients helps them to have an informed decision on what kind of risks they're introducing. If I could summarize it all, I would relate it right back to the theme of keeping balance. We're really building a plan so that our clients can remain invested in all market conditions. Jim often mentions in letters and in client meetings that time in the market is so much more important than timing the market. And that certainly holds true today. Before we conclude our full presentation today, I wanna to take a minute to go over some key points that all of our speakers have made. First, we heard from Troy a lot about inflation, but he really talked about how to build a good bond portfolio to combat the risk specifically of rising inflation. Matt talked a lot about our stock approach to building an all weather portfolio. And he even touched on how stocks could be a long-term hedge to inflation. And then we reviewed how to keep your uh, balance in your plan, your financial plan, and stick to it over time. This powerful combination is what's going to help our clients ride through these uh, varying market conditions. Well, thank you, Lori. And I think everyone can see why I think Lori is such a superstar. Um, when I was making the introduction, I forgot to point out that for the second consecutive year, uh, Lori led the firm in new business. Uh, second place person wasn't even close. So uh, she's very popular, attracting a lot of new clients. And I think she might have to put a waiting list in place. She's been so busy. Um, but Lori, uh, maybe a question for you. Uh, you're always thinking about financial planning and next steps. With the market down, are there, are there timely sort of tactical financial planning moves that people might consider? Well, one thing that we have been uh, working on recently um, in these first couple of weeks of the year with the market down is the possibility of Roth conversions. So we're looking at client plans and to see if there is uh, maybe room to pay some extra taxes or recognize extra income for clients. And it's a bit of a perfect storm if you can do the conversion to your Roth IRA when the market is depressed so that you can get the rebound in your Roth IRA portfolio, which will be free of tax for your life, rather than having a larger amount over time that you will pay taxes on out of a traditional IRA. Thanks, Lori. Uh, we've had a number of good questions come through. And uh, earlier I asked Troy about gold in the context of volatile markets and inflation. We've had a fair number of questions and I'll let Troy or Matt jump in. Um, fair number of questions in this unusual environment, high inflation, volatility, et cetera. Uh, what's Bartlett's latest thinking on things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So either Matt or Troy, take that one away. Uh, certainly, uh, Troy, I'll, I, I, I can start with that and um, feel free to, to jump in. So, you know, we don't have a strong investment opinion on, on cryptos and, and things like Bitcoin. You know, it goes back to that argument that, that Troy made about gold. There, there's really no way to value uh, a cryptocurrency. There's no fundamentals that support it. Um, it is what it is based on the price people are willing to pay for it. 
And we, we've seen obviously volatile swings in, in, in the, the crypto markets. You know, last year and this year, uh, crypto has been, been basically cut in half over the last few months. And, you know, that is not something at this point that we're comfortable putting in client portfolios. And what we've, what we've seen that over the last couple of years, the correlation between cryptocurrencies and equities has strengthened. So maybe the argument several years ago could be made that this is some sort of a diversifying, and, and I don't really even want to call it an asset class, but a diversifying place to put money. Now it's trading much like equity. So that diversification uh, is no longer there. So again, th th this is still early, it's still evolving. And, and that's not to say that down the road, maybe there will not be a place for it, but today we're not comfortable with it because it just really doesn't fit, you know, kind of what we do, which is a lot of really fundamental value oriented type investing. Matt, I would, I would only add that it's, it's also such an unregulated area that there really uh, are few uh, understood uh, rules of the road, so to speak. So I think that's something that will also develop over time and help uh, guide us as we uh, all learn more about that, that new, uh, new currency. Let me unmute. Uh, a question that Matt could answer. Um, Matt is our, our, among other things, covers the technology sector for Bartlett and does it so well. And one of the uh, listeners notes that uh, just the talk about rising interest rates from the Fed has taken a toll on stocks, specifically technology stocks. And uh, so he asked the obvious question, um, what about when rates are actually raised throughout the year as Troy suggested? Yeah, so we've seen, you know, if we think back over the last year and in episodes where, you know, we, we see rising rates or rumored uh, increase in rates that the tech names have sold off pretty hard, especially those higher growth ones. And, and I did mention that kind of in, in, in my comments that higher rates are, are not a good thing for more gro growth oriented companies. As, as you think about discounting those future cash flows back in, in today's dollars, it's just not as valuable. But you, know, you got to keep in mind that, that stocks move well ahead of, of actual news. So stocks often move on, on rumors and speculation, and sometimes they actually perform better after the fact. So our thing, my thinking and is that, you know, when we actually get that rate uh, increase from the Fed, it may actually take that wall of worry down. And just having that data point, getting past that can actually maybe be a good thing for not only technology stocks, but the market as a whole. So we're in that period where we're anticipating and stocks are reacting to that anticipation and rumors. And, you know, we're hopeful that once we get it, as I said, we're actually going to see, you know, kind of a relief rally to some degree. Matt, a question came in. Um, stocks are often characterized, as we know, as either growth or value. And I, you know, as a firm, we, we think that gets kind of oversimplified, but it is what it is, growth or value. And uh, recently, value stocks have done better. Do you think that's a lasting uh, turn or how are you thinking about this in your research work? Yeah, so um, I'd say this, you know, when we go through the process of I, I identifying, you know, those high quality, well-managed companies that I spoke to, we don't really put them in a camp of a value play or a growth play. We look for companies that, that if anything, probably straddle both of those definitions. Companies that, um, you know, have good growth opportunities, but that stock price, as I said, that trades at an attractive price. So, you know, we, we, we kind of, you know, we'll participate in both and, and we're really focused on kind of that quality growth company that trades at a reasonable price. Um, and if you actually look at what's happened in the market, and, and I know a lot of people will say, you know, we've had this growth to value swing. What we've seen is really a move from higher quality and, and even growth to really something that's not so much value as it is low quality. Uh, for example, year to date, what's really worked in the market is low PE or low multiple stocks. We often associate low multiple stocks 
with low quality businesses. So it's not so much a growth to value as it is a, a quality and growth oriented shift to maybe some lower quality businesses. Thanks, Matt. I, I know in your work, you've always emphasized that, you know, not being doctrinaire about this, either growth or value, but being flexible and all weather in your thinking. Um, here's a question maybe Lori can tackle, although others are welcome to chime in. Um, and and the, the listener is asking specifically about opportunities in China. And of course, we know last year, the Chinese market was a rare exception. It plummeted 20% as they had all these regulatory crackdowns, one of the worst stock markets in the world. Um, the client is asking, are there, are there opportunities in that market that fit into our strategy? And Lori, maybe, maybe take that uh, even more generally, uh, where does investing in foreign markets fit in? Certainly foreign markets, as you look at performance numbers, have not been as good as the U.S. market and specifically large cap U.S. stocks have been the best place to be for about 13 years. So when you look at your foreign investments, you have to wonder, you know, what role do these play? Um, what role have they played and how will they uh, play out going forward? And we think that if you have a long term view that the diversification is going to be very helpful. There's a lot of reasons to believe that they, um, you know, when you see the cheaper valuations, better cash flow on dividends, uh, that that will be, you know, good enough to hold on. And there will be a point in time where we might actually want to actively add more to our international uh, parts of our portfolio. But right now we're just holding where we are and we think that it will be very helpful over a long-term period, but it shouldn't be looked at as a short-term, uh, you know, trading investment. Thanks, Lori. Uh, Matt, we have a listener uh, from Marco Island, Florida. Uh, weather's a lot better down there than it is here. Um, he wonders specifically about uh, your thinking on the major auto companies, General Motors, Chrysler, Toyota. With all this competition, electric vehicles and so forth, uh, what's the future hold for those companies? Yeah, so I, I guess I'd say, first of all, I'm jealous is it's, you know, not even 20 degrees here and with single digits, I think, overnight. Um, so Marco Island seems like a nice place to be. So when I think about, you know, the, the traditional automakers, um, obviously they've got their challenges. You know, Tesla has come in and has proven to be a, a significant disruptor to the industry. And I think that caught, you know, the Fords and the GMs, you know, a bit off guard. That being said, they are established players with uh, known brands, uh, they have the financial resources and seem very committed to going down that autonomous and electric vehicle path, much like, uh, much like Tesla has. And um, you know, they even have some really interesting and, and, and to a degree, maybe better technology. I've, I've read you know, uh, some, some reports that compare GM to Tesla and many people believe that the, the autonomous vehicle that GM is working on is far superior to that of a Tesla. So. I think they get there. Um, Ford has had some, some nice production uh, announcements, as has GM. I think the commitment's there. And, and I think they will get there. The, the technology of an electric vehicle is a lot more simple than that of a, of a traditional gas-oriented engine. So the ability to, say, catch up um, can happen a lot sooner. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that you know Tesla will continue to do well but the others will catch up. I know BMW is investing heavily in electric and autonomous vehicles, Volkswagen the same, um, you know, Honda as well. So it's going to be a competitive space. I think Tesla has the lead, but I do think there's a place for Ford and GM and I think they will close that gap over time. A question about healthcare, Matt. You mentioned that it is um, a large sector waiting in our portfolios, I think second only to technology. And uh, the listener wonders, uh, we seem to be undergoing a transition in healthcare from this historically a fee-for-service model, now more of a value-based model. Um, and uh, 
how does that affect our thinking about healthcare? I think what he's wondering is, does that just make for a much more challenging environment, a less freewheeling environment in which these companies have to make money? So yeah. uh, why don't you give that a try? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. So yes, as I mentioned, you know, we are overweight healthcare as we have been for a while. And in, in the issues um, and the questions that were brought up are, are things that we discuss on a pretty regular basis. So one of the ways that I'll answer this is, you know, despite the headwinds that healthcare faces, we still see th these as very durable businesses, um, you know, with still with attractive growth rates. And, and these are very innovative companies and, and will continue to adapt to the external environment. But one of the things that we do to, to really hedge ourselves within that space is that, you know, we spread our risk over, you know, a number of companies. We have a lot of holdings in healthcare and we buy companies that uh, have different focuses. So we're not all focused, say, on, on drug development companies. We have some of those, um, but we own a company like uh, Thermo Fisher, who is in the life sciences. So they partner, say, with drug discovery companies. Um, we also own a company like United Healthcare that is focused more on the insurance side of the business. So, you know, healthcare is a really broad based sector. And you know, we apply that to our approach. We try to get exposures to certain of the various industry groups without making heavy bets on any one. And I think it has served us well. As I said, you know, it, it was a good performing sector last year. Our performance within the sector was, was solid as well. So I think spreading that risk among many different companies that have different focuses really helps avoid you know, making a certain bet in, in case some, some significant changes would come to the, the, the industry group or sector. Thanks, Matt. I'm getting the signal to cut off, but uh, I want to give the last question, I go a little over time, give the last question to Lori Poole, because I think it's a good one. It comes from a listener in Boston. And uh, Lori, this listener wonders about uh, ESG. And so I wonder if you could talk about uh, ESG investing within portfolios and how Bartlett is doing that. Maybe kick off by defining for people exactly what ESG is. Quickly, I will touch on how the uh, industry has evolved. So um, ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance investing. So uh, back, I would say, in maybe the 70s, there was a lot of uh, people that didn't want things in their portfolio. So they would just say, okay, if I don't wanna be invested in fossil fuels, if you're an oil company, you're just out. Um, the industry has evolved into more positive and negative screening. And that's sort of where Bartlett thinks that it is best for clients. So we're looking at investments uh, that match not only a client's risk tolerance and future goals, but also match their social concerns as it relates to these different areas of environmental, social, and governance, and how a, a company uh, can fit into their portfolio as a good investment and make them feel good about how they're investing. So this is something that is, uh, I would say, uh, continuing to evolve and has picked up a lot of uh, in a lot of conversations and clients are uh, very much interested in this and how to structure their portfolios because they're not really looking to uh, not keep up in an investment front and not have good portfolio returns, but they really wanna feel good about their portfolios. So I would say that this is not a large number of our clients, but where it makes sense, we can completely transform a client's portfolio to match their goals on all fronts uh, so that they can, again, sleep well at night and uh, re feel really good about about their portfolio. So if anybody wants to talk specifically about that, um, you can reach out to uh, any one of us and they can either answer your question or direct you to me and I can talk to you more about that. Great, Lori, that's a great way to finish. Uh, we wanna thank everyone for tuning in today. It's been a marvelous turnout. We got to almost all the questions. There are five that we couldn't get to within the hour and we're gonna get to those people offline. So your question will be answered. And I also want to point out that uh, by registering and participating in this uh, a webinar, you will get an email from us with a link to uh, watch it all over again if you want. You'll, you'll, you'll get the slides and the recording and uh, maybe someone in your family that couldn't join you for this and, and wants to see it, you'll get a chance to watch it. Um, but we're 
very, very grateful for your interest. It's obviously a, a momentous time in the markets given what's happened in January. And uh, I hope you come away with the thought that uh, Bartlett is battle tested and has the kind of strategies and disciplines in place to get through this and make sure that you're you're well positioned to secure those rewards that the market gives us long term. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, a year from now or so, we hope to do this in person, but uh, uh, again, thank you and uh, good day.